What's up, what's up, what's up? I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And we are back with episode number 18 of No Labels Necessary. <laughs> you can catch us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, every Tuesday, Thursday, wherever you listen to your pods. Why are we called No Labels Necessary? Because no labels are necessary for we to, for us to build what we're trying to build. And you can't box us in with any kind of labels. And the people who listen to us and rock with us, we feel that y'all are the same, you know? We attract the same like minds attract. So yep, let's yep, yep. let's let's get in to the type of content we like to talk about. We already know music content, business content, marketing strategy. And today, as always, we have to start with some advice. A little bit of advice. A little bit of advice, right? So we're gonna get into our rate that advice column. And I want to know, of course, what y'all think about it. This is from my boy Nipsey Hustle. He has some great game for y'all, but. There's some nuances we want to add to it on top of that and how you can apply it to yourself. So check this out. Nipsey, go ahead and drop them gems. When I dropped Prince, y'all, Top Moscow was hitting me. He's like, bro, you killing him. You did one thing wrong, though. I'm like, what? He's like, you called it a mixtape. Like, you should have called it your album, bro. You tripped. I'm like, nah, because I didn't want to have a sales history. 50 Cent told me that, man. He like, you know, years ago, he like hustle. He like, um, regardless of what they say, you're in a good space because you never sold the album. So when you go back to negotiate your deal, you don't have a sales history. They're going to have to top your perspective sales, which, which what they think you might do. And you from the coast, you from L.A., you got a big market. You know what I mean? They're going to compare you to artists like, you know what I mean, that have sold units on the West. And that's going to impact your negotiation. Whereas if you just, if you go indie and sell 20,000 units, they're going to base your, your deal off of that. And I'm like, damn, that's that's good information. I never I never thought of that. So I made sure that I didn't go to retail until I did my my deal. You know, when I dropped Prince, y'all. Mm. 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 Always gems on gems from Nipsey. You know, there's there's gonna be hella post Nipsey post humus uh, Nipsey gems to come for years. And I think with this one right here. First of all, it has 50 Cent again. How many stories do we hear with 50 Cent dropping some kind of game for people? And it worked. And it works. And one, y'all need to hear this not only as an artist, but then this applies in different ways as an influencer, right? There's so many things to break down. So let's just start here. The advice itself, right? I don't know personally, right, how relevant that is today versus when Nipsey first got that advice, right? And I'll say what I mean by that. One, Nipsey, I let's say, let's just say that was 2012 or something. I don't know. Right. Today, the industry is a little bit more aware and a little bit smarter. Because what he was talking about is a it's actually a bad way to judge shit. Right. And the industry it was it's notorious for sometimes being slower to judge things properly. Yeah. Right. So if you you drop these albums, right? What's the difference between an album and a project for the artists themselves? Like today? Maybe the amount of attention to detail around it. The amount of attention to detail. Yeah, how, how much they kind of emphasize it. Because it's kind of like burning to our brand as consumers that album means like, oh, it's about to be some big shit coming. You know exactly, yeah. exactly. It means it's something more serious. Yeah. But beyond that. Same thing. Same thing. Exactly same thing. Yeah. Same thing. Right now, of course, we can get into more details where it's like, oh, okay, there might be a bigger marketing budget. Da 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 da. But generally speaking, if you're an artist that has no resources or very little resources, and you're dropping all these mixtapes, nine times out of ten, when you drop this album and you aren't signed yet, you haven't gotten any additional investment, you're still just dropping the same project with maybe more attention to detail. You made it more serious. There's nothing else to truly judge it on. So that's a, that's an unfair judgment to just say, Oh, now that he called it album, I'm going to compare it to the rest of the world. Right. Mm. However, the reality of the game kicks in and that just is what it is. (laughs) And you got to rock with it. So it's important to understand these nuances because that same thing transitions to any of y'all who are, influencers too right um like i remember talking with jo and he's cool with and he was talking about how he 
wasn't on TikTok yet. So this is probably like 2020 when we were talking and, you know, was helping J.O. Um, advise him on just some of the stuff he was doing with TikTok. And then he was talking about all his other friends who were trying to get on TikTok. And he mentioned and he was like, he's not trying to get on yet. Why? Because TikTok was paying influencers to get on TikTok. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he didn't know what his numbers would look like when he got over there. So what was he doing? Holding out so he can get the biggest check possible based on his footprint in the rest of the Internet. All right, my YouTube following is crazy. I've been spending all this time developing this. My Instagram page is going crazy. I spent all this time developing this. But if I go hop on this new platform, I have no idea what it's going to look like. So I'm not going to try to get any money after the fact. And plus, you now have that leverage. I'm on the platform already. So what can you say? But as long as I'm not on that platform yet, you can imagine and speculate what my numbers can do for you. So yeah. he was holding out and not getting over there until he broke bread with TikTok to get onto the platform, which TikTok was doing heavy when they were, you know, when we started hearing about TikTok crazy, yeah. a huge part of it was they were paying a lot of influencers to be on the platform. So that same thing is what I think about when I hear Nipsey say, yeah, don't call it an album, right? Because all it does is change the context that they can argue against. And that's what goes into the negotiations a lot of times. We know the reality is you shouldn't look at this artist who doesn't have X, Y, and Z resources and try to say his album should be judged with, I don't know, Dr. Dre's album or whoever was popping in the West, Kendrick's album, right, in, in the West Coast at that time. You should be saying, based on his resources and he's performing this way, this is how we should judge him. But nah, from a negotiator standpoint, you're going to argue in your favor. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Other albums in the region, they do X, Y, and Z. So, here it is. This is all we can pay you based on the numbers. A big part of this advice is basically maintaining your leverage and understanding where leverage comes from on the other side of the table. Yeah, and semantics. And semantics. And semantics, bro. Like, semantics play a, a big part in it. Yes. It, I, I do think about, at least in the context of what, what he said, going back to it might be a little dated. Because I think today if an indie artist came into, into the situation and was like, hey, I sold 20000 albums indie that today would be impressive back yes. then yeah that would not that would not yeah, be impressive exactly. right? so that's I, why i started with that yeah, question yep. yeah so i do think like it, it could kind of flip there but yeah the biggest thing i got out of it was like understanding semantics and the way people are going to perceive things based on like what you call it right because and, and all it is is changing words but this is a mixed site oh, okay cool the pressure just dropped a little bit i'm judging it a little as harshly oh you called it an album well this is what i'm typically used to seeing happen around an album, whether number-wise, resource-wise, and everything else. And I didn't see these, so therefore I can say, you did not have a successful album, right? Like you said, the argument would be, but I didn't have those resources. But yeah, semantics, bro. All of it goes back mm -hmm. to semantics. And who is who has enough leverage to play with the semantics the, the way they need to <laughs> and bind you to that shit? That's how I look at it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then, to be fair, Todd Moskovitz, the guy he mentioned, gave him the advice that he should have dropped the album, probably was coming from a standpoint of what he thought might have been Nipsey's best interest when he said that. Yeah. Based on the way Nipsey talked about him, right? He didn't give any kind of bad tonality like he might have been somebody who was trying to like play him, right? Yeah. So he's probably giving him good advice, but then you always have to understand the reference point of good advice, right? He's an industry person. He's, you know, in the game from a different perspective of the artist, yeah. right? So he might be thinking to build Nipsey up and have give him leverage for one thing, but 50 cents like, yo, eh, as the artist, right? And the entrepreneur type, you are like 50 cent is himself. And you want to look at things this way, right? So it's always interesting to take note of who you're getting advice from and how they're choosing to give advice because I'll recognize that as well. Like a, a lot of times when I'm giving somebody advice on a one-on-one -on -one basis, it's like, all right, so what kind of advice do you want? All right, there's different levels on it. Are you trying to play this game, this game, or that game? Once we understand what game you're trying to play, then I can cater advice based on my understanding to what that looks like, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh yeah, you know, you're just trying to flip, make money short term. You're trying to own things in the long term. Do you have publishing leverage? Do you like you want to tour heavy? You want not want to tour at all? All those things matter. So, like who you're talking to matters a lot. Um, and even when you're getting well intended advice, yeah, you still got to think for yourself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. At the end of that, there are no real 
right or wrong answer, right? Like you said, like mm-hmm. both of them could have been giving him advice from with the best of intentions. They just kind of pulled in different directions based on what those people went through. But like, I, I feel like I always feel like that's the biggest thing people need to understand in music. There are no right or wrong answers. There's always going to be things that happen that on paper don't make sense. But then it happens. And, you know, people like to point the finger back. I'm like, oh, you said this wasn't going to work that way or it should have worked this way. And it's like, well, sometimes motherfuckers is wrong, bro. This, this is just how this shit goes. You know what I'm saying? Because like, I think we yeah. said a couple episodes ago, but like most people in music, I don't really know too many people that speak in absolutes. Like most of us are speaking from, hey, this is what I experienced, right? Mm-hmm. Like this is what I went through. Yep. This has kind of been my path that I walked. And X, Y, Z things happened when I did A, B, C. You know yep. what I'm saying? Not saying that if you do A, B, C, X, Y, Z, what happened? But this happened for me. Yep. And so I think that's always important for people to like remember when just picking and choosing who the advice is coming from. Like there's a context of what they've been through match up with you, what you might realistically be going through, right? Like you said, like if I'm taking advice from an artist who has been in the label system all their life and I'm not an artist in the label system, right? It might only be so much that applies to me versus an artist that is in the label system might be like, yo, this motherfucker spitting, you know what I'm saying? Like, this this motherfucker genius. You outside of it might be like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, like, the things mm-hmm. you're saying don't make sense to me and even vice versa, right? Like, there are people who in the indie spectrum that might give advice that, like, label artists are like, nah, bro, like, that shit is not going to fly, like, within the operation that I'm in and what I'm yeah. kind of building in. So, I do always think that's the biggest thing is like music is about combining, taking all the information you can get and like piecing it together for what makes sense for you. Right? It's like a puzzle. You know what I'm saying? Like, all right, this from you makes sense, the rest of it don't. This from you makes sense, the rest of it don't. But together, I got my answer. You know what I'm exactly. saying? I know what I need to do. Exactly. Hey, look, that's the tool for life right there, man. <laughs> because your ship is your ship and nobody's ship is going to look exactly the same. And I always say, People struggle with the fact that they got trained in a school system where there is a A, there is a B, yeah. a C, or a D, and one of those is right. Yeah. All of them shits could be right in music. Yeah, exactly. You know, all of them. It's all about you. Every single option can work. And look, maybe only one of those options works one time, but damn, it worked one time for yeah. somebody. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they're winning, and it was right for them. That's the reality of how how you know this thing works but it's frustrating when you're used to things having to be this absolute right uh one answer and then you hear four or five different things yeah. and you're like oh this person must be wrong because this other person said that or whatever reason or this person's more experienced or they have this title and accolades and you'll be surprised at how many people who have the titles and accolades will be so wrong at least in your situation that's partially why the new crop yeah, <laughs> always up. rises yeah. up right because they're doing what's modern the people who didn't want to get on streaming and social media because they hated that and they didn't have to do it that allowed more people to pop up and they were right for that time and the advice uh, which also um like reminds me first let's go ahead and rank this advice me i'm gonna say a 10 out of 10 mm. because of what how we interpreted it yeah okay I'm right sorry, damn, that might be the first the first 10 out of 10 <laughs> Yeah, I, but it's, to me, it's that important, though, right? Like, he had, because he had all the makings, right? You had two different people, yeah. both qualified, but there was better advice. Also, he was able to stand his ground, right? Got this advice. Nah, I'm not going to do that because I got this other insight, yeah. right? And was able to stick to that insight and recognize that's the best advice. So, it's not just what he said, but also how it's presented and, and recognizing everything at work. I think that's a perfect example of how artists need to be able to move to find success in the industry. Yeah. I mean, I guess when you look at it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I guess when you look at it that way, I give it like an eight. Give it an eight? It ain't, it ain't 10 out of 10 for me. Like right. said, cause, only because of the situation. Like I said, the, the the number breakdown, I think, wouldn't apply to today. I, I A part of me feels like if you came into a situation today with what he was talking about, it might be a bit more strength behind it than right. trying to give them the hype. That I agree with. Yeah, yeah, Again, yeah. I so. started with, with that plot today. <laughs> yeah. so, I'll, so I try to go for principles, not the details, because the details are flexible, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think the principle 100% applies. But yeah, now nah, today I am popping indie artists. So we're not saying, so yeah, let's clarify that. Yeah. Uh, why you said it was a 100% we are not saying don't call something an album. All right, or do call something out. Man, well, I would even say that. Don't call something an album until you feel like you have the resources to make it appear 
like a big moment. I, w- I would stand on that. Well, that, yeah, see, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's still the same yeah, advice. Yeah, so yeah, even then, you're yeah. still agreeing with yeah, the yeah. context of it, yeah. right? <laughs> but we're, yeah, we're saying the, the way you will be judged is likely not to be exactly the same, though, because yeah. people have more context and they don't expect any artist to do that. But, you know what? I'm going I'm to still pull it back, though, and say, because of the negotiation aspect of it, yeah, nah. <laughs> just for that alone for one you want to make it appear that way and two the negotiation leverage nah I'm gonna have to 10 off 10 out of 10 all the way around fuck how people see it in the, in the game they can and will they will still play that game yeah don't get me wrong they they will see you as a better op and I judge you harshly but they will still play that game cause they can yeah, yeah. alright yeah. now not everybody cause you gonna have some people who are more fair and that's probably when people you know you might get in agreement with you're like alright this person makes more sense but if you let them, they will use that against you. Yeah, because too many, why not? Yeah, it's too many points to use against you, not to use something against you. You know, you're never gonna 100 percent get out of that. Yes, you could be. Oh, you sold 100k. You toured 12 cities. Oh, but you only got 20 thousand followers on Instagram, man. We can't fuck with you. It's like, damn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, hey, that's the way it goes, man. That's the way it goes. So keep that in mind, right? Um, just put that like put that in your pocket, right? Like yeah. just to be aware of what the other person on the side of the table has to negotiate with, right? In terms of how they see you, not with their own leverage, but literally how they can manipulate your leverage. Which I was arguing with somebody the other day, and it was about like the law, right? Illic and versus social society. I think legal, like government, right? True law should be very objective and we should culturally shame people into the behaviors we want right (laughs) (laughs) but it shouldn't be legally (laughs) in action right you know shame is like a loose word kind of being tongue in cheek but we should culture we know we know that culture generally speaking sets up a lot of the outcomes that happen all right whatever the law may be Right, a lot of times we try to make them go hand in hand, but now things are so different. All these diverse thoughts, so law can't follow it all. Law has to be objective, right? Culturally, we can push people to what we want to. And my whole point of that was, well, this guy I was talking to was like, well, nah, we should make the law like this. We can't make it objective like that, or you can't think of it that way. And I'm like, if you get a lawyer, they are going to tell you hey this can be interpreted to the worst case scenario Mm -hmm. right and they are going to adjust the the um the messaging for the worst case scenario because even if you don't think it's going to occur all right your lawyer is going to say because this does allow for that to happen you need to eliminate that possibility yeah well they not right a good lawyer will do that so when y'all are signing y'all contracts that's the type of stuff that they're they're looking for and you always have to be thinking about that, right? Yeah, we're in this good, you know, you have some people that you're just in a different type of agreement. The relationship might be there, but still, just generally speaking, you want to make sure you eliminate that. So that law legal conversation made me think about this, which also, you know, comes back around when we look at contracts and negotiations. It's like whenever you're looking at the, whenever you're looking at the details, it's like, it sounds crazy to say the extremes you're like, oh, you're just being skeptical, da 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 But then the situations that we hear about <laughs> all the time. They're extreme. They're extreme. <laughs> they're extreme. You bro. didn't adjust for the extreme, <laughs> man. Yeah, the extreme is possible. Just because it's extreme doesn't mean it's impossible. Yeah. But I was thinking about this the other day, just with going back to that whole, you know, no right or wrong answers, you know, whatever, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's like you could have something and be like, this doesn't work 98% of the time. And I was like, damn, what about that 2%? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, what about that 2% that it does work for, bro? Mm-hmm. And that 2% comes along and there's nobody talking to them because 98% of the time, this shit don't make sense. I haven't had to think of an answer for you. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Or like talk to you to put it through a situation. So I always think about that, bro. Like, yeah, no matter how much something doesn't work, there's a small group of people that will work for it. And you should exactly. be prepared. Like, move as if you won't be that person, right? But in the back of your head, be prepared for it if you do. It's like going viral, bro. Like you should move every day like you won't go viral. But if, yeah. you, if you do go viral, you know what I'm saying? You better be ready to shift gears and move be quick. Ready you know what to shift saying? gears, one hundred percent. Move fast. Yeah. One hundred percent. You know, you don't expect to get in a fight. But if you do, 
right? Better know how to swing back. Better know how to swing back. <laughs> <laughs> Part of my interruption, but I know that many of you guys are planning your new year, trying to figure out what steps are you going to take to make sure you blow up or take your career to the next level, whether you're a manager, artist, or label. I'm sure you can get benefit from planning. We all can. Now, with that being said, you may have been aware, but me and Ja'Cory are doing one-on-one calls for the holiday period for 50% off. If you want to schedule a call to speak with us where we can go deep into your specific marketing plan, these talks are great, but getting into your specific marketing plan, listening to your music, see what's relevant to you, go ahead and schedule at the link in the bio. There's, I think, maybe four days left by the time this releases. All right, let's get into it. But, <laughs> no, I'm not going to go that direction. All right, next question, next question, though. We actually have a really dope conversation that we want to highlight on the Bramman Network space where Lucky Daddy, <laughs> I hope I'm saying that right. Is it, is it Lucky Didi or Lucky Daddy? I'm I'm going Didi. All right, Lucky Didi, you got to let us know how we say this, man. Um but are videos not effective anymore? All right. That's the question. And when, there are a lot of commentary in this space. And many I agree with, but let's let's get, get into this breakdown. As of lately, I've noticed my shorts on YouTube have gotten far more organic engagement than any of my actual visuals that I've spent money to shoot. I've been able to gain more subscribers from my shorts than actual videos as well. Based on this experience and what I've heard from different sources, it seems as if it's better to post content for your music than to shoot actual videos for some until you have an audience that is truly engaged in your visuals. It's more cost efficient for me in this case. Plus, attention span is so short now. What are you guys thoughts? I mean, I think touched on some very quality points right there. Yeah. All right. So let, let's just start there before we get into some of these thoughts. Right. The biggest thing that I always speak to people about when it comes to this is the cost effectiveness. Yeah, the cost, bro. All right. What's the number one thing when we're talking to artists that they typically complain about? Money. Money, 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 bro. Yeah. So why would you do something that's going to cost you money? Like you, you have to think about it is I have this machine. All right. And it's not the best machine. So I have to make proper decisions, right? You know, I'm, I can build a car around it, but I'm not going to be able to, you know, go off road with this thing. I need the road to be smooth. So I need to manage this as much as possible. What am I going to do? Am I going to spend money to get, let's say, I need to drive from Atlanta, New York with this car, right? It's going to take more gas to go off road and all these winding directions. And then do I have enough money to fill the gas tank up <laughs> enough times? Probably not. Not right. It's, 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 I just, I got just enough. So in this life, when it comes to your resources, especially when you have very, very minimal, you need to focus it. Yeah. All right. Music videos, they have, I don't want to say zero return. Cause we just talked about, there's always the, the, the other you know, percentage, but the chances of your music video going viral, eh, very low. The chances of your video going viral without marketing, even lower. Mm -hmm. All right. And we're already talking about being in a position where we're worried about money. So you probably not gonna have money to create a high quality video and do marketing. Yeah. All right. So cost is going to be a huge thing, let alone the fact that most people that I see still are paying too much for their music videos, in my opinion. All right. Now, that's just my opinion, but I think a new artist shouldn't be looking at 5K for a music video. Yeah. All right. Now, you can barter and they say, oh, my my cost is 5K, 13K, whatever, whatever. If, if y'all are bartering, I mean, kind of is what it is. You didn't have to come out of pocket and maybe you gave them a service or whatever, or, or they felt like you have clout. So you gave them insight to, or you you could post their music video. I mean, your music video on their page, all those type of things. Cool. But yeah, you're, you don't have a hundred thousand fans and you're paying a 10th of a hundred thousand dollars. Don't make sense. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And it, it lowers, uh, maximum ROI on spend. Right. Cause I look at it just because of the way these socials are set up. Most of the artists are promoting their music video 
through snippets of the mu- <laughs> through snippets of the music video, right? Yes. So it's essentially, let's say I pay five k to make this video that I now chop down into five or six snippets to promote, and I get whatever impact out of it. I don't know. Let's just throw no. Let's say you get ten thousand streams of views out of it, versus let's say you. I don't know, pay someone to make you uh, five or six TikToks around the video or around the song, and that costs you, I don't, I don't know what a videographer would charge for that. Let's, let's just say like, let's say 200 an hour. Let's just, just say yeah. that. it take you three hours to shoot all those pieces of content. That's $600, right? Yep. And then that same output gets you the same 10,000 streams, 10,000 views. One costs you 5K, you know what I'm saying, to get that. The other costs you $600 to get it, right? So the potential... For like the bang of the ROIs, I think is much higher when focusing on the short form over the the long term um, over the music video. Music videos are something that like artists for the most part get right. Like yeah. everyone doesn't have the most amazing creative vision when it comes to their music videos, but you understand for the most part like where music videos fall within the artist ecosystem. It's it's social proving, right? You are a popping enough artist, or you take this seriously enough that you're producing high end assets on the back end, like. All the artists who I watch to take it seriously do. But the name of the game right now is short form content. That's something that most artists don't understand. Yeah. And so it's like, hey, you can you you always know the vehicle for a music video is there. Like there's not gonna be a point in time where like someone they may be less effective, but we're always gonna be accepting of music videos, right? That's never going away. So I always look at it, why not spend the least amount of money to get the same impact while also learning how to figure out something that you don't quite understand, but has a, the chance to have five to 10X the, the return for you than like a one one music video drop might have. You know what I'm saying? See, that right there is something that makes me think of the fact that Chris Brown, we just talked about not dropping his music video till mm. how many years later? Longer, it sounds like four or five. Four or five years yeah. later, uh, we ha- we just referenced another track where the song, the music video didn't get created till probably like six or seven years later. Yeah. Like Ja'Cory said, like your music video can come. Yeah. Right? Like most people on the industry side, more the executive side, they're pretty savvy and look at music videos as something that we're willing to invest in once the phone, song takes off. Yeah. Because now it makes sense. But why are we putting all this money behind something that we don't even know if it's going to work? So let's hold back. It doesn't mean never. It just means not now. And then never if it doesn't hit. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, you drop this music video, things take off, bam, let's go ahead and, and you know, build more around the world and space of this particular song that's moving. But like you said as well, people don't quite understand short form content. And I think one thing that's not being taken seriously when it comes to short form content is literally treating it as serious as a music video yeah right artists are missing that opportunity like crazy by just not being creative i'm baffled at how many times i've had to ask artists to be creative (laughs) it's like this is what you're supposed to do like don't leave that creativity in the doll and then all of a sudden you're just a normal person clark king everywhere else you go when you're thinking about the video concept you're thinking about your tiktoks you can be that creative you can think about your brand you can think about what you want to present but then, of course, you have to figure out how you cater that to the platforms. And it sounds weird, like, oh, I don't want to have to understand the TikTok algorithm, da da da. But generally speaking, even musically, people are adjusting their music for the platforms and the times. Mm-hmm. People make shorter music today because of the times, right? It's still a social algorithm of sorts that you're adjusting to, yeah. right? The way yeah. you m- mimic your hooks, and some of the terminology you use, all of that's there. You're always using that. So don't take that mentality. Just think about it as, Okay, there are certain types of things that work on these short form co- um, content platforms. How can I maybe break five mini clips into something that still represents something as a whole, maybe? Right. So maybe they tell a story throughout all of those clips, but they still stand separately. And yeah. if you get this content creator, videographer like that, who is like, hey, how can we think about this specific snippet together and create a 30 second snippet? that makes an impact right communicates the video and my vision presents the song in a hard way bam we do that and then how can we do that again it's kind of reminds me about uh duckworth when he did the series promoting his live uh, no his streaming his live streaming show 
where it was a commercial series yeah. and everything built off of each yeah. other, right? Yeah. You can build off of each um everything in that same way. So I don't know, man. I just want artists to be more creative or I just wish they realize they can be. But there's something intimidating when it comes to the short form, maybe the quantity that it requires, or maybe just the fact that this isn't this artist specific platform like music videos you think oh music artist right but you're now looking at what everybody else is doing so you leave your artist box and you're like whoa i'm a fish out of water from that perspective but you don't have to do that you could think i'm an artist right a visual artist a music artist and i can project whatever world i'm trying to create through that um so i think i think that would help if more artists kind of took that that mentality towards and had some people on their team that could think of short form content as something that uh, we can, yeah. you know, we can really build on and, and represent our brand with versus just trying to follow a trend to go viral. Let me take a quick second to say if you're an artist trying to blow your music up or if you're a manager, a music professional in general trying to help an artist blow their music up, I have something that's a game changer for you and it's completely free. As you may know, we've helped multiple artists go from zero to hundreds of thousands of streams. We've helped multiple artists go from hundreds of thousands to millions of streams, chart on Billboard, go viral, all of that stuff. And we've now made the way we've branded multiple artists and helped them go viral completely free, step by step in Brandman Network. All you have to do is check out brandmannetwork.com. You apply. It's completely free. But the thing is, we're not going to let everybody in forever. So the faster you apply, the better your chance of getting accepted. Brandmannetwork.com. Check it out. Back to the video. Yeah, it's like the uh, like the La Russell model um, with, with him and his content person. I, I was actually going to say that, man. It's like you, you go back to the 5K music video. It's like one 5K music video is three months of a retainer from a good content person you know what i'm saying like yeah. you can find a content person for 1500 a month and they really help you get that shit down and you know it's three months of development versus like this one video that you still have to figure out how to market and you still don't have the skill sets to, to push it forward with the content right so yeah. i even look at it like that uh because going back to it the video is always going to be there you always have the option as an artist to come back at some point in time to make a video we as music consumers don't really care you know what i'm saying like it's nice when we get it <laughs> yeah. but if we're being real about it like if you put your consumer hat on, even for other artists, like how long do you care about that video, right? Probably yeah. for about as long as you care about a TikTok or as you care about an Instagram <laughs> short or a reel. But the difference is that short, that reel, that TikTok costs you probably, you know what I'm saying, two to a hundred times less than that video costs, you know, depending on your resources and where you kind of are with things. So yeah, yeah, I agree with that, bro. It's like that, that long-term impact, like it's really so many ways you can make a much longer term impact for the cost of like one music video. Bro, add on top of that, are you even thinking about your favorite artist music video like that? Maybe your favorite, favorite, favorite who's dropping and they have the full rollout, you know, the top, top tier. Yeah. But most of the music you hear today, you're not thinking, oh, I wonder if this has a music video. Yeah. There was a time and that was how we thought, right? dope song i wonder what the video looks like or if they're gonna have a video that's immediately what you're what you're connecting it to that's not the connection what does your mind go when you hear a song that you like when i hear a song i like the first thing i do is well the first thing i do is i go to their page well, well, yeah, well actually let me double it back well soon i just found this i like i so, would say it's two it's two ways okay. to look at it yeah. <laughs> i don't know who this is and then yeah. the other way is i know who this is already and this is my first time hearing that song the a new song from them so okay let, let's start with I don't know who this is. All right, so I don't know who it is. So I, I find them. The first thing I do is I go look at their account and I try to gauge like how long they've been doing this. Like, is this one video I came across like a fluke or they've really been like killing this shit? And I just like scroll through, maybe look at five or six videos. I'll click over to like their Instagram, maybe look at a couple posts. And then from there I go to Spotify and I try to see like how big they are musically and where the song is at. That's typically where I stop. Unless I see something about a music video on their page, and then it kind of splits. If I like the song enough, I go watch the video. If I don't like it enough, I'm just like, oh, I just really like the song. This is cool for now. Let me add it to my library. And maybe a couple of listens later, 
I'll finally be like, okay, let me go watch the video. You know what I'm saying? Because the video, I got it. Are you even automatically looking for the video or is no, that if but, you saw that a video existed? Yeah, like if I just am scrolling through the Instagram and I see a clip for it, I'm like, okay, that's cool. I got a video for it. Yeah. I'm probably still not going to watch it right now. You know, like I'm, I'm going to just listen to it a couple of times. Because videos, bro, that's attention span. Like a song, you can just throw it on the background. Video, I got to watch that shit. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like that's, that's two to three minutes of my life I'm giving you. <laughs> and I take that shit seriously. Yeah. Um, so that's typically the process, and then I'll listen to the song a couple of times, maybe like once or twice. I'll talk to see if I like it as much for real as I thought I liked it from the clip. Because I mean, they don't get talked about enough, but you know, sometimes, bro, the snipping on the internet be the best part of the song. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it, it, you'll listen, you'll be like, okay, what the fuck is this? Like, nah, nah, I'll just go back to just following bro on TikTok. You know what I'm saying? I'll support from the <laughs> sidelines. So I ain't gonna really stream it a couple of times. Now, for somebody I know, now, actually, artists I do know, my first thought is that I have a music video. I usually go look for it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, if I know you well enough, yeah, I'm like, oh, shit, I wonder if you got a video for this. I go look. Like, oh, I ain't got a video for this? Okay, well, same process. What else have you been doing? What's your Spotify looking like? What's your socials looking like? Why do like? you think you do that if you know them already? I think. And when we say know them, are we talking about, you know, kind of you just know who they are, know them, or are you more of a fan? Kind of know who they are to feel like somewhere in that spectrum. Like, if I am familiar with you even if i'm not a fan i'll still go and watch because at that point i still look at like research purposes you mm -hmm. know what i'm saying like i'm still keeping up with what's going on um we're just like just kind of seeing like how one side of you know a certain spectrum maybe moving compared to like the side i'm paying attention to and if it's a fan like someone i'm a fan of yeah I'm, i'll go watch it regardless like, if i'm a fan of ours like i'll pretty much like if i know it exists i'll go check it out you know if i know it exists and it doesn't cost money i'll go check it out you know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's the type of fan that i am and so, but with those people, you ask why, I think it's because, like, the the trust has already kind of been built, mm. right? So, if I'm still a fan of you, then that means that you've consistently given me things I like from you. So, I'm assuming that I'm going to like this thing that I, I see from you. And then, a part of it, too, because I catch myself falling for it, but we always talk about how fans are really just people that like feel like y'all would be cool if y'all like met in real life you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. like, they, they feel like y'all be bffs and like y'all would get a drink together and just mm -hmm. be like the best of friends i do look at a lot of artists i fuck with like that i can't even lie like i'm like man like <laughs> glow really probably be cool as fuck to hang around bro i go yeah. watch this video i fuck with her bro let me go watch this video so her she get the extra view you know what I'm saying let me be the bump in the algorithm that get this shit going so That's funny. a part of that is me taking part in like fan culture and just being like because i i like participating in so in ours career as a fan because we're usually the ones behind it you know what i'm saying you don't really get to be a fan you know he's like you like you like uh i can't think of her name like like the wizard you like the girl peeking behind the curtains on the wizard of oz bro yeah. it's like ugh, i'm tired of looking behind the curtain bro. i want to be on the, the other side of it for once you know i want to be wild and amazed and right. magnetized <laughs> and shit so That's so i do it just to like be able to participate in the fan experience you but know it's funny you say that because <laughs> i at one point, I had an opportunity in the NBA, like from a work standpoint. Mm. This is after I'm in music. And I literally said, my music industry <laughs> has experience has ruined <laughs> my music fandom. <laughs> I don't want to ruin another thing yeah. that I just love for the sake of love. Yeah. You know, like I, you know, I it's not that I don't enjoy music. But it's definitely a completely different world in perception. <laughs> and I so envy sometimes the ignorant consumer. Bro, you know, so much, bro. Like, I, sometimes I get upset because I'm on the inside of some of the ignorant stuff they say of why certain actually uh, stuff actually happened and da-da-da, whatever. But just the ability to enjoy in that pure, ignorant way, yeah. right? And build the narrative and world that you want to, whether it's true or not, man. Bro, it's beautiful, bro. I, I do miss that. <laughs> yeah, bro. Like, and people ask me a lot of times, like, man, like, how come you guys never reach out to some of your favorite artists that y'all do campaigns? And I'm like, because I want them to just stay my favorite artists. Like, I don't want to, like, I don't want, I don't want to be calling Travis Scott Jaquise. I don't want us to get to that level. You know what I'm saying? Like, like no, bro. I want to stay behind the, the persona and see everything through the lens of what you intended for yeah. us as fans to see. I don't want to be sick of this by the time it comes out because I've been listening to it for the last six months. You right. know what I'm saying? Helping you prep for the now rollout. I can't and enjoy the whole yeah. rollout the same at one moment. Yeah. yeah. I actually have an artist homie uh, that did this recently. Like, he used to always send us leaks of new music. And like, outside of him being my friend, like, I'm a, I'm a big fan of his music. And maybe like a month ago, we were at one of his shows and one of my friends was like, bro, like, you ain't seen me leaks in a minute. And he's like, yeah, I was thinking about it, man. Like, 
I feel like I'd be killing y'all fan experience and I don't want to do that to y'all. So like, I'm not sending y'all leaks anymore. And like the rest of my friend group was like, man, that's fucked up, bro. What the fuck? Me, I was like, thank you, bro. Cause yes, like you really <laughs> have been kind of like killing it for me. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't get to, en- I don't get to enjoy in the moment like the rest of your fan base does just because I'm your friend, bro. That's fucked up. You know what I'm saying? I want to be, I want to go through the roller coaster like everybody else going through the roller coaster. Yeah. You know? So, so I care about that, bro. Like you said, bro, there's, there's, there's some trauma in your music enjoyment experience that comes from working in the music industry, bro. And I don't want that across the board. So, nope. so when I do come across the artist that I can just really ride the fan roller coaster and just truly be a, a part of the fan experience, like I would do it. Like I'll take part in it. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. Like I'm, I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm a receptive fan, bro. I'm that person that at a show, like you tell them to lift their hand up, I'm lifting my hand up. You know what I'm, I'm that I'm that person, bro. Like, you know what I'm saying? You got me through the process, I'm right there with you oh, if yeah. I like you enough. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that does affect the way I kind of go. But like a new artist, I think I'm more so looking like for reinforcement that I can trust their decision on whatever they're gonna try to push me to. And the the easiest way to get yeah. that is typically the music, right? Like you make a good song, I trust you a l I, I trust your judgment a little bit more, right? You told sure me this not. shit was hard. I went and listened to it. That shit was hard. You just got five trust points from me. You know what I'm saying? You ain't at zero no more. And I trust you a little bit more, right? And then maybe I keep seeing other things from you and I'm like, okay, you know, it's building up the trust point. And this video was hard. They go two more trust points. And this reel was hard. They go two more trust points. And like now over time, as you're telling me to go do things and check out more things, and if you've built up enough trust points, the decision for me to decide whether I'm going to do it is a lot snappier. Like I'm like, no, I'm going to watch this shit now versus like, mm. Let me add this to my watch later and like come back in like three days and see how I feel about it, right? The one that gets me to watch it immediately has built up a lot of trust points. The one that it takes me some time, you know, they might have some because I didn't make the decision immediately not to watch it, but they don't have enough to make me go check it out in the moment. You know what I'm saying? Like, and there are just some artists who you've watched for so long and have seen build so much, like their trust fund with you is like crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like, think about someone like a J. Cole or a Kendrick, but he's he's had 10 years to build up his trust fund with me. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So like at this point, it's like, I've seen enough from you over 10 years that I, I trust whatever you're telling me to go check out versus this little who the fuck ever that I just learned about yesterday. Bro, you got five points. It's going to take a lot for you to just make me jump at shit <laughs> immediately, you know, because you ain't, you ain't got there yet. It's just yep. the reality of it. No, bro, that's exactly how it works. I have plenty of things outside of music that have worked like that where I have people who did not trust what I told them to do. Mm. And <laughs> they're like, dang, man, I should have listened to you. Mm-hmm. Or dang, I should have listened to you sooner. And then that kind of thing happened again and again and again and again. And now they're like, yeah, man, man, you know what? Whenever you tell me, I get right to it. I'm like, man, I'm surprised you did so fast. It's like, yeah, man, I learned my lesson over time. Yeah. When you tell me about X, Y, Z, you just go ahead and get on it. And that has nothing to do with music, but that's literally what's happening with everybody that you build trust from, yeah. right? Yeah. Like you can the more trust you have, the less time it takes for them to act on whatever you're trying to you know, direct them to do next. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's, it's, it's underrated. Like the building the trust factor part is completely underrated because I think artists tend to think of the process of becoming a fan is like super linear, right? Like you heard the song, you liked it. Like, why are you not a fan? You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like, that's not enough. It's like, because the fan relationship is about how much I trust one, just your music opinion and taste, right? Like your style. Mm-hmm. And then it becomes about how much do I trust your lifestyle and then how much do I trust you as a person, right? And like if you're able to kind of clear fan expectations at each level, like you have a you have a more than likely a, a very successful like long term career. Yeah. Right. And then if you're not able to clear fan expectations in certain levels, like that might be sometimes what's holding you back in certain areas. Might be why you're like hitting certain ceilings, right? Because maybe I completely trust you in your music output. Like you make amazing music, but then every brand deal you've ever done has been trash. You know what I'm saying? So I don't mm-hmm. trust you completely when you're telling me to go buy certain products. Yep. Because you you suck over here. Or maybe like your content has been amazing. Because I've seen some artists like that. I've, met, I've seen some artists that make amazing content. And then you get to the catalog and it's not that great. So it's like, I trust your judgment over here, bro. You're amazing at this. But this thing over here ain't, ain't one of my trust it's yet. So, so it's typically like that, right? Like you're building up trust factors with your audience on like each of these kind of different categories. Like your music, your creativity, and then I guess your affinity to certain products as you get more into like you know flipping your brand for like for monetary purposes and thing and like it's just underrated like how much like trust is a big thing like all that shit the more you say that the more i think about how the fan relationship relates to dating and marriage yeah 100 yeah. percent. like it's literally over time i like you for one thing you might have brought me in for your looks right mm-hmm. 
Now it's about the conversation and the part that they never want to talk about when it comes to especially marriage is that day to day work. And you think, man, (laughs) I gave you all of this. How come you can't give me the benefit on benefit of that on this yeah. or this? Like, why are we arguing about this now? This little thing is so small, but we've done all of this other stuff. And I'm showing you the love. All those things are in place. Why are we arguing about this small thing? That's how fans are, yeah. right? Yeah. I just fell in love with you in terms of this song. Man, now you got two, three songs. You know what? For the people who really kill it, they might have a whole album and it's a moment. Yeah. But is that next album going to hit though? Is that next album going to hit though? Right? It's like, dang, bro, y'all, I I gave you one of your favorite songs. This is legit one of your favorite songs. Why are you- Should change your life. You should just be streaming (laughs) this next thing off the strength. Yeah. Why why do I still have to market to you for you to listen to my next song? Right? That's how I might feel as an artist because that's how it feels in a relationship where you're like, dang, why I still have to (laughs) convince you and and, and wine and dine you? Why we still need date nights? Like, why do these things still have to happen? Look, I don't got the answer for all this shit. (laughs) But it, it's something about human nature, bro. You can't stop. The work continues. <laughs> you got to keep putting that work in. And I think so many artists think of making it, right, as the point where you get to stop, you know, where some people might think of marriage as a point <laughs> that you get to stop. <laughs> bro, that shit don't stop, bro. Just take it from me. None of that shit stops. It's a never-ending grind. <laughs> never-ending grind. You know what I mean? The only thing that changes is the way that you look at it, your perspective <laughs> on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> So you can change your perspective in a positive direction and say, you know, I'm investing, you know, instead of I'm grinding, you know what I mean? I'm building. You can use all those positive type of terms, but, you know. At the end of the day, you're just working. The work is the work. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. So, you know, artists get used to that. And that's why it's, that's why we speak so much on building systems and understanding the game, because how many times have we heard people say, oh, man, I got a label. But the label didn't really do anything, or I expected things to just take off, but they're still where they are, mm-hmm. or I still had to work so hard for certain things to happen. These are all things that you're adding to your machine. Just look at yourself as you having a machine. You have to have the machine, and the people on your team add to the machine and have a function to it. The deals and partnerships, they're all adding to that machine, but the machine is still the heart of it. You are the engine, whatever that looks like for you, and the further things get away from the heart of that engine, the less, I don't want to say less impact they have because they might have some great impact because it could be a big investment that comes from the outside, but the less responsibility they have at the end of the day, right? You can say whatever the agreement said, but hey, if this is, if I got a business and you're employee number 100, no matter what that agreement was for employee number 100, you know what I mean? That's nothing like the person who's right up under mm-hmm. me or whatever. You know what I mean? Or my own personal shit responsibility and, and leadership or whatever. Right? Mm-hmm. That's that's the way it goes. So let's get back to actually some of the stuff that the people said in the group. Because I think there were a lot of dope personal experiences from the artist and um, shoot, managers in this community. For example, Adrian Milanio said traditional music videos aren't needed as much as they were 15 to 20 years ago or moving into short form content. I think they're important in the sense of looking legitimate, Mm -hmm. but out of all the things artists should be focusing on, I think quantity of content that resonates with people is going to lean towards being more important than a flashy music video. My favorite part of what he said is sense of looking legitimate. Mm -hmm. And you kind of alluded to that yourself, right? It's just like, hey, I take this thing seriously. And people are trying to gauge, do you take yourself seriously? Are you just another influencer, right? Yeah. Right? Or one of these random people who just decide, I want to make one video, or are you truly an artist? Because once you can tell somebody's truly an artist, now I might think about, oh, are they on Spotify? Mm-hmm. Or are they, in, are, are they in these other places? Do they have tours? And that's something that's always been important, right? Having a certain level of seriousness in terms of your appearance appearance as an artist but i think that's more important today than ever when you have so many people who are doing music but are not necessarily that serious yeah taking it serious yeah yeah um this other one says let me see jermaine gum said i think today's audience likes music videos but not as much as they did years before adrian milani was correct today's videos is short form yep so agreeing right there you don't see too much ahead but i i think it's interesting when that 
Jermaine used the word like, right? Do you think people <laughs> like music videos less now? No, I mean, I don't think they like them less. I think I think the attention span for them is a lot shorter because of how much video content we're being served. You know, it's like at this point, every social media platform is video focused. Yeah. You know, so like your whole day is you watching mini movies, mini music videos, you know what I'm saying? Short snippets of longer interviews, but you're literally consuming video content. Like, yeah, for as, as long as you decide to be on the internet. And yep. then the music video is just another piece of video content. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, bro, I've been watching, I've been on Instagram <laughs> since 10 o'clock. It's 12. That's two hours of video content. I just saw your new music video release post 30 seconds ago, bro. I'm burned out. Like, I don't feel like, why? I was about to go hop off and like go outside or something. You know what I'm saying? Go get some hey, fresh air. Like, bro. Oh, I just left work <laughs> yeah. and we got some new skills that we need to gain. So they sent us some video tutorials. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I just sent somebody a video clip explaining or asking them a question. They sent a question back. We just got off a Zoom call. It's all video. Life is video. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I definitely agree with that. We get a lot more burnt out on that today. And Johnny Rayborn, by the way, you know, these these comments again this is brand man network it's our free community brandmannetwork.com check it out however everybody can get in uh, we want to make sure we keep this quality and you know if you want to hop in make sure you hop in sooner than later because we don't know how long we'll be taking people for free at least johnny rayborn said short form content fuels long form content yep. that is a fact like you already kind of you just said it jacory you want to yeah. Want to say something before I finish? Nah, man. I'll say, say finish if I can. He's basically about to hit the spot on. All right. In the new formula, more people will see your shorts as an intro before they ever see your long form. But once they like your short term, they will swing over to your long form. Yeah, that's why I want to take away from my, my boy Johnny because that, that's pretty much it, bro. Like yes, we sir. We said it before because we first started noticing it with TikTok mm -hmm. where the example I give the people is – Think about your, the average music video is probably, what, like three to five minutes long. Yeah. And so in that amount of time, someone could have watched five to, let's say, 20 TikToks, shorts, reels from you, depending on how long they are. Let's say five to 20, somewhere in there. Yeah. So that means in the same amount of time as it takes me to watch one video, I could have went through multiple videos of you, had the trust factor built up a little bit faster. Um, and... I now want to watch longer form content from you because I was able to get into the, get that trust from you so quickly. And like we like I said, we see it with TikTok. Like one of the, the biggest places that people convert to from TikTok is YouTube, right? So they're literally like it's, it's literally you are training your audience to fall in love with you through 10 second snippets, 20 second snippets. They're naturally gonna be like, damn, like do you make longer form content? Like, can I see some some other stuff from you? And so there is a human element to it where I think, you know, that um we're kind of programmed that way. But then, like he touched on, the algorithms are moving towards that. Like we 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 read off uh, Leo Cohen's plans for YouTube a couple of episodes ago. Yep. And in that report, he literally said his his goal is to make shorts be a vehicle to push people over to the long form content. He wants to have that line built clearly between audience short form to long form. So we know that the platforms are getting ready to focus on that, or at least YouTube is getting ready to focus on that. Which means at some point, the rest of them will also start to focus on that. So that says a lot about what you as an artist, how you as an artist should be thinking about your short form to long form content pipeline. You know, like even going back to like, we're not saying never do a video. We're not saying, you know, it's impossible for them to work. We're just saying that their structure in, in your in, in your system as an artist is much different than it, than it would have looked like 10, 20, shit, even like five years ago. You know what I'm saying? Like to be real. But yeah, it's like if I, I'm looking at your TikTok and if I don't like these five, 30 second videos that you put up, I'm going to assume I'm not going to like your music video, right? It's like, here was a exactly. chance for you, like going back to what you said, here was a chance for you to show me your creativity and why I should listen to you and things like that in a very short, digestible manner for me. You know what I'm saying? This is this is, this is is a very low risk way for me to decide if I like you or not versus me going to watch a five minute video from you. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And so it's like, if you can win me over here, I'm naturally going to assume that I'm going to like everything else that I see, whether I'm, I'm, I'm wrong or not, right? Like, or I'm right or not. But I'm naturally going to assume that. And I think that's how most people look at it coming from short form. Hey, man, I've binged 10 of your TikToks in, in a minute and a half, and I like eight of them. Y'all go watch your video. Like, I'm, I'm assuming I'm going to like what I, what I see over there. Versus, like, you have nothing for me to gauge it off of, and you just want me to assume that shit on the other side is nice? That's wow, right. I don't know you to trust you enough like that, right? Like, to mm -hmm. to assume that. So, no, I'm not going to. So, 
Yeah. That's right. But it's literally just a vehicle. Now your your fans are well, no, not even your fans, potential fans, the yeah. consumer. There are those people that are like, yo, you gotta come to me. Yeah. All right. You wanna have a relationship. I'm not gonna ever holler at you. I'm never gonna be the one that walks up to you in the club. You're gonna have to walk up to me <laughs> no matter what. I could think you look the best in the world, but you gotta walk up to me, convince me. And and like you said, right, going back to the creativity point, this is your moment, right? Mm -hmm. You got a split second, right? How do you look? How do you smell? How are you like projecting yourself? What kind of talk game do you have? <laughs> And all right, bet. Let's have a longer conversation. Or I'm gonna go look at everything else. People were doing this mm -hmm. already themselves. We already do this anyway. The thing is, it's just broken down, right? A lot of the stuff that's happening on the internet today is not as different as we make it seem. It's just that now we have a way to technologically separate it into the boxes that we naturally do in our thought process, mm -hmm. all right? So now, oh, okay. Short form, that's the teaser. Long form, all right, that's the full blown thing. And then the sales process, like all that's there and everything segmented. So we're thinking about things in these very specific seg segments. We're thinking about niches versus just trying to go big and hit everybody and make the world hear us because it's accessible to make each of these things a profession. Yeah. <laughs> to, uh, is, is that accessible? Um, or a legitimate route to build. And um, Eddie Hart, he dropped something. And I think this is a great way to round this whole conversation out. He said, I think taking a phased approach is the way to go. I agree that building an engaged fan base that's ready to consume a full length music video is better ROI than using that music video to build that fan base, right? So I'm going to deliver it to you when they're ready, not use it to build the fan base, all right? That being said, you can leverage a music video by chopping it up into pieces of micro content with a text overlay laying out the day of the shoot or something to deepen the song's narrative with a call to action to watch the whole thing. <sighs> I'm starting to resent something about this. Oh. Could actually do a ton for driving views to the music video itself. Some food for thought. All right. I like some of that food. I'm not eating the whole plate, though. <laughs> what we just talked about, being creative in your short form content hmm. is the antithesis of just taking my music video and chopping it up into pieces. Hmm. And we know that we do it. We know that many other people do it. And mm. we know that it works, right? Yeah. But until somebody starts to think beyond that and just say, bump, music video and just chopping it up into pieces and says, no, I'm going to just create short form content and keep it like that in these snippets. We're not going to see people truly see as many gains as they can from this. Yeah. Right, we always talk about doing something contextual to the platform, but you also have to be contextual to the format. So, if you take that time to think, "Hey, I want to make it specifically for this format, whatever that looks like," that's going to be better. You can chop up your music video, but it's not going to be as great at the end of the day as saying, "Hey, what does this look like for this thirty seconds? This fifteen seconds? What does it mean? I can think about my call to action now." With that being said, there's a, another hack, so to speak, that I think more people could take advantage of. You can shoot your music video in a way that's aware of the moments that make the most pop, all right? If I shoot my music video in the way that takes into account the fact that, yo, this is a really dope moment, so I need to shoot it in a way that's going to be cut for social media, but also works in the context of the whole music video, then now taking snippets isn't that bad or diluting things. Mm. Because what happens is reverse engineering in a very organic way. You are basically saying, how can I make the best product possible? And we know the best products are always the most marketable at the end of the day. From an organic standpoint, the product itself is the marketing itself. So if I say, oh, I'm creating this really dope concept, but now I'm not just shooting it 
in this typical way, I need to make sure this person's closer to the screen or all these things are in the shot at the same time because if I do it vertical, then, you know. It's going to look off. It's going to look off, yeah. right. You take all those things to an account at once, then you're going to save yourself a hell of a lot of money, actually, which we don't talk about enough. Uh, but also, you're going to give yourself a marketing asset that's going to go a lot farther for less money. But really quickly on that a lot less money thing, spending more time up front saves money, point blank. Yeah. And I think one thing that people rob themselves of is trying to create certain things so quickly in terms of their content that they don't spend time on the front end saying, how can I be super creative on the front end? So there's really dope moments in here. So it just pops because it's a great music video versus I shot a music video. Now, how can the marketer that I hire get really creative with this piece of content to figure out how do I make it something worth commenting on? But you can do that by making it something worth commenting on up front. You can plan out your shoot so it doesn't take five, six hours, right? Mm -hmm. Like all those things that you do ahead of time, spending more time on the front end when it's cheap and you don't have to pay for the team, the the the, the videographer and whoever else needs to be the spot that you're you're paying for. Spending that time up front, laying out all the shots, right? Understanding what's going to pop, where you're going to get the most out of it, doing that up front is going to save you so much money, right? And I don't think we promote the actual craft side of it enough because, you know, I mean, one, that's not, people don't ask us enough, right? <laughs> don't, they don't know what we be doing on that side of things yeah. or how we think about that side of things. But that is the X factor a lot of times when you look at these teams that are really killing it, it's those little details as well. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and even to Eddie's point, bro, Eddie, bro, that's like three pieces of content max in your rollout. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, one good snippet with the headline CTA, a little making of video, maybe one blank one, you know what I'm saying? So you can get that. And that's it, bro. That's that's three pieces of content out your, your whole rollout. So, yeah. yeah, I agree, man. I agree with everything you just said. Well, part of the interruption, I have to take this quick commercial break to let you know that we are sponsored by me because I signed myself. We signed ourselves. It's this brand man network. That's why we're called No Labels Necessary because no label, nobody else is necessary for us to get the train moving. So if you could just subscribe to show appreciation, we'd really appreciate that. Back to the program. With that being said, we got a, a deep dive we want to get into. Something that's really, really important mm. for the year coming up. All right. Now. When we say the year coming up, what could we be talking about? What's important? What's so important? Well, look, everybody wants to figure out the new year's coming. How can I get popping? Yep. All right. What's going to be relevant? What are the new things that I should be doing? What are the old things that I should be doing to make my music move in this next year? And marketing moves so fast. I think a lot of artists miss out on the things that already turned the curve. Yeah. You got to stop doing that. So for this conversation, we want to talk about overrated music marketing tactics for this year to come. All right. Now, let's start off with websites. Websites, websites, websites. Artists, I hear the right thinking that people tell y'all to do or that y'all share among the community. I got to have a website. I got to have a website. I got to have a website. I disagree. You don't need to have a website. You can have a website, 100%. I'm not going to say don't have a website, but the fact that you think you need to have a website to grow your fan base and all these things, especially as an artist starting up, I don't think so. Now, let me break this down. One, we talk about resources. Part of your resources is not just money. It's time, effort, right? Your actual attention span so you already have to do all this other stuff on social media that's going to create fans, right? That you already probably don't want to do because you just want to create music. And you also have to create music, by the way. Yeah. All right. These things already have to occur. You might not be somebody who can build a good website or you might use these templates. But how are you going to get people to this website when you're really trying to get them to your music? So they don't matter at this phase of your career like that. But then let's get to the elephant in the room. The big thing that so many people say, I need a website for. I need a website because... I want to own my own information, man. What happens if Facebook dies tomorrow? They have another shutdown or some weird political stuff happens. And all of a sudden, I can't access 
my followers on IG or whatever happens on t- Twitter or on TikTok or any of these platforms. And we know uh, it's been some times where you, we actually have not been able to get on Instagram. It's yeah. been crazy, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, do you actually have to have a full website for that? No. All right. Not at all. Not at all. Especially today. Maybe this is more relevant and easier to talk that way before. But today, there is literally these link tree style smart URLs that allow you to collect somebody's email. Yeah. All right. Or, and this is an e- easier hack and probably my most suggested in that category, there's a lot of these email platforms, right? Let's just say MailChimp, right? Aweber, Drip. A lot of these platforms now have a form feature, mm-hmm. right? So you got your email platform so you can collect everybody's emails, but you just create a form, whatever you're trying to sell is that single small landing page that collects their numbers, collects their e- name, collects their email. That's all you need. You don't necessarily need a super official website domain. You don't even have to have your, your name. It could still be, you know, I don't know, brandmanshawn at aweber.com. Now, I know it doesn't sound as sexy, Right, you want to have your official thing, but when we look at the actual statistics, the effect on click through rate at that stage, especially of your career, the numbers don't really play out. Like it doesn't make a difference. Mm-hmm. Right, so a website is something that you one hundred percent can do, and it's not going to hurt you outside of the fact that you might not have time or not, or you might not be good at it or, or you might not, might not know how to arrange it. But the, the most important thing that most artists are trying to achieve who are thinking about it correctly when they think, oh, I want to have a website or something, they're thinking about, oh, I want to have some, have data, mm-hmm. right? A control space. Some kind of control space. But you're not doing much through your website. What you're really talking about is you want to have the information, their phone number, their name, their email, we have all these things with text me if you want to. That can get people's number right there, right? If you want to get access to my next music video, just text me or send me your number, whatever, whatever. If you want the merch, there's so many ways to get that stuff. Um, so it's overrated. Not completely ineffective, but it's highly overrated. And it's time that people look at the other ways because it's cheaper, saves you hella time. And, you know, when it comes to pixels, most people aren't even really using pixels to the extent yeah. that it really makes sense. And most of them let you pixel anyway. Like most of the smart link providers at this point give yes. you the option to pixel them. Yeah, the smart so, links and the email people yeah. Um, yeah. The providers let you pixel now. So. Yeah, so that's not even like a, a strong enough point. But I, I literally just had this argument with someone like a week ago, bro. Like it was somebody on the concession call and they were like, yeah, I'm about to make a website. And I was like, why? Why? It doesn't make sense, bro. Like Because as at least you going back to that zero to 10 argument, if you're anywhere between like a zero and like a four, no one cares about the website. I argue you could get away without a website up until like an eight. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like for real, for real. Because mm-hmm. um, I think about artists now, I know now that are doing millions of monthly listeners, millions of streams, and they do not have websites. You know what I'm saying? They're funneling people maybe to some type of community. Or like you said, back end, just collecting phone numbers and emails and things because they don't want to do that maintenance. of. Uh, this is another platform to maintain, which is a, mm-hmm. the part of it I think a lot of artists don't think about. Like this is, it comes with the same level of maintenance as your instagram account or your tiktok the only difference is you're paying for it <laughs> you know what i'm saying so you're paying to do it and you're it i also think it goes back to the artist not thinking about the end consumer you know what i'm saying like you create this thing because it looks nice to you you feel like it makes sense in your funnel but most feel like music consumers today really only probably go to an artist website to like buy stuff maybe merch tickets you know what i'm saying so if you're at a point where your audience isn't ready to be monetized or they're not buying things from you, then they really don't need a website. Like, cause like you said, everything else that you would use a website for can be done with like one or two other platforms for free or relatively cheaper and with a lot less like work put into it. it takes you all of five minutes to make a smart link. Making a good website gonna take you a minute. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it's gonna take you some time. Yeah. So And look, keep be clear, the data is the thing that matters, yeah. not the website itself. Yeah. Because, you know. Amazon servers have gone down and people's sites have, <laughs> yeah. have been yeah. done away with too. So that's still the same theory that you think you're moving away from. So with that being said, let's get to the next thing that's eh, a little overrated. Ja'Cory, put them on game in terms of these TikTok influencers. Where are we? 
with TikTok influencers. Yeah, TikTok influencers are super overrated. So I do, I do want to preface it by saying this. I do think that you can have a successful TikTok influencer campaign. I just think the way that is typically thought about is super overrated, right? So before we've kind of looked at TikTok influencers as the magic button, relatively cheap compared to other influencers. The organic engagement is usually, you know, five to 10x what it could be on other platforms. And then the possibility that this idea could, or there's the idea of this, this uh, one influencer post could just spark a, a whole bigger thing in terms of like a trend or something like that, right? Which all that stuff is possible. It's still very much so possible. It just happens a lot less, right? Like I think back to what, 2019, 2020 when we were doing TikTok, bro, it was like some viral shit like damn near once a week yeah. versus today, bro, it might be some super viral shit like once every like three months. You know what I'm saying? Three, four months or something like that. Um, relative to like how big the, the platform is now. And so I think they're overrated in the sense of creating this massively viral moment. Not saying it's impossible, just think it takes a lot more for that to happen and it's going to happen a lot less and it's going to continue to keep happening a lot less. Um, now they do still have their use as just, I think, a regular marketing tool. Like if you're looking at, you know, a dollar cost average of the amount of attention you get for the money you put into it, and you're just looking at it like a regular brand awareness campaign, or maybe judging it from the same way you judge a YouTube influencer or Instagram or other social influencer campaigns, right? Then there is still value there. Nobody gets a YouTube influencer post hoping, like thinking it's going to go viral and change everything, right? <laughs> yeah. Like you don't get an Instagram influencer post and think like, oh, this one post is going to just spark everything off. It might, you know what I'm saying? There's a high chance that it, that it could, but I don't think most people are planning their campaigns necessarily with that being the end goal. They're planning it a little bit more strategically and logically. And I think that same level of discernment and thinking needs to be applied to TikTok influencer campaigns for it to be effective. If you're looking for like the old school, yeah, let me just pay 30 motherfuckers with hella followers to post and this shit should go viral and create a trend. Sorry to say, probably ain't gonna happen that way. Now, if you're like, hey, here are six influencers who I feel like audiences represent who I wanna speak to and I don't expect their post to go viral, but just speak to the right people. Yeah, that still makes sense. You know what I'm saying? That still can have an impact. So overrated in the context of creating like these these magic moments like they used to. There it is. <laughs> there it is. It's just misplaced expectation. Yeah. And at one time, it was rightful expectation. Yeah, 100%, bro. Because that's how they got that opportunity. That's how TikTok start popping. It's like, yo, I'm hearing that people are blowing up over there every day. What's going yeah. on? Let me get into the house. Now, yeah, no. Nah, it's not so much. But- the cool thing about it when we talk about the brand awareness side that you talked about is if you look at these relevant influencers, right, you can still get your image built within that community. You can still start to create this social proof effect of someone's willing to actually physically do something to my music. Yeah, That's so different than you running an ad on the music video itself. This person is socially saying this is okay, right? To show love to this thing, even if they took money for it, like because people are aware, some people are doing pay for, um, pay paid campaigns. The fact that they were able to take payment because so many people are turning down horrible music, yeah. right? So, someone doing something physically to your music is still amazing content for you, yeah. and it is cheap when you compare it to hey, I need to hire some people to shoot a video for me and bring them out in my city and we're going to meet at this location and set all these things up. How much do I owe you, right? The way somebody with no following would think a lot of times and how much they would ask for would end up being more than just somebody who has 50,000 followers yeah. on TikTok. People with 50,000 followers, you could pay them $50. Yeah. 25, some of them, and get away with it, Right. And they're still shooting content. And now you can use this content in so many other ways and, and catalog the experience and narrative of your song. All right. So I think that's it's an underrated, uh, no, an overrated thing in terms of that expectation. But 100 percent like what you said, man, it's, it's still valuable. Yeah. And, and and please understand this. Right. It's like the regular marketing stack virality is something that has to be engineered, but is never 
the primary expectation, mm -hmm. right? It's the icing on the cake. It's, it's the icing on yeah. the cake. That's what you want. But you don't expect it as if, hey, I deserve it because I did these things. Today, we still have some artists that feel like, oh, because I paid five influencers and spent $2,000, I deserve to go viral. And if it didn't go viral, it's because of the marketer's fault or because the influencers did something wrong. They didn't post at the right time. It's not that. It's a lot of other elements that we're not going to get deeper into because this isn't a solely TikTok um, segment. Um, but yeah, just, just know that everybody's feeling it. It's not just yeah. you. <laughs> but, you, but you touched on a really important point too that I think helped the way we looked at TikTok influencers and that's looking at them as work for hire content creators. Yep. Right. Because now the bang of the buck is strengthening. I could pay you a hundred dollars and let's say the post only gets a thousand views and I might feel like, hey, that wasn't enough return from the brand awareness perspective. But you as a creator made me an amazing piece of content. I still think the video is dope. And they have all these ideas on how I could use it in my ads maybe or like maybe pay some other pages to repost it and do like whatever with it. And then that doubles, triples like the value you got for like the payment. And I know, because like I said, bro, we were right there at the front of the gold rush for TikTok. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I do want people to understand that, bro. This, we, we speaking from being at the front of the line, like watching how it kind of changed like um, from down out. And yeah, that to us, I think that for us was a big game changer once we kind of sat down and was like, hey, like if that post does great, Cool. If it doesn't do great, we need to be looking at the actual content and what we can do with that so we can strengthen the bang we got from it in terms mm -hmm. that the audience kind of makes it weak. So, yeah, I just want I don't want people to sleep on that part because that shit really does. Like you can get your brand and think of it that way. Like, bro, I'm the brand awareness I get is the bonus, but I'm really paying you for the content and what I plan to do with it after that completely changes the context of like the TikTok influencer campaign. Everything. Every time. Everything. So next we have selling merch Ooh. overrated overrated <laughs> from a standpoint of selling merch via ads when you don't even have a fan base okay All right there's a lot of people who have done merch sales trying to offer something for free to create a fan right and i understand the funnel and i know that it's worked in some dynamics, when you have a, a lot of funnel knowledge and you break down all these things and you've seen some level of success by offering something for free and now you have this fan's information and now you're giving some stuff on the back end. I get that. So many people have, have done it, but most people don't see the greatest results out of it. Here's why. Because one, how are you selling merch to someone who doesn't know and care about you? How are you trying to build your fan base with merch? It doesn't make sense. Mm, right? Okay. And a lot okay. of people are doing that or okay. still think that that's like a thing. Now, here's a sub tier to this. Another thing that I think is overrated is merch that reflects your music and your face directly. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. 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 It's like, no. Yeah. Today, <laughs> You have the ability to build a lifestyle and a messaging around yourself. And if you just allude to that a lifestyle message and vision that you represent for people, you can build an entire brand that doesn't even have your face on it. That's popping. Like, I know um, an artist, she told me that she made like three, four hundred K in merch last year, but she doesn't even associate herself with it anymore. Like, people don't even know that she's behind it. Because it represents a larger message. Yeah. Right. And now she's almost just like a spokesperson for the brand yeah. as yeah. How, how people see her along with some other people that they'll have put on the stuff, but they don't even know it's her. It's like the golf wing model. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So don't sell yourself short. Represent, represent something greater. And you can always have these small capsule launches that are more you specific, right? That's built around this special tour, built around this special album and is limited, right? And done in that time, you do it and take away, but you have a larger merch brand that can sell at any time, any day, as long as somebody reps the message. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but I, for me, I'm just about the artists making money as soon as they can and give it and, and reducing the friction. Again, not never saying, not ever saying I'll never drop 
merch with my face on it or with my album cover on it or something like that, right? It's just understanding that you can flip the model and make money and build a brand and a culture regardless. And then next to that, right? Your merch brand, right? The company that you own can do a collaboration with you as an artist. Yeah, yeah. And I agree with that because I think, yeah, the important distinction is the using merch to like grow. Because I agree, bro. Like, if you're not in a position where you think you can sell the merch, you should not be pressing the merch. Even if your your context is, hey, I got a show on Friday, it's going to be 50 people there. I think I can get 10 of these off. Mm-hmm. Cool. I will understand that situation. You know what I'm saying? Like, go for it. Why not? People people be drunk at these shows, man. They might drop, a, drop 30 <laughs> or 40 out of nowhere. They will. But, yeah, if you are in a position where you don't think – I was looking at, like, if I don't think I can sell at least – double my inventory i won't do it like that's how we used to look at when we did shows like all right we want to press up 40 do we feel like we could get off 80 you know what i'm saying yeah if yes then let's go for it if not then let's keep building and keep trying to build demand for it and i know a person that worked out really well for us because by the time we did drop merch like that shit was just flying the fuck off you know what i'm saying um i'm big on that by the way creating those type of parameters mentally mm -hmm. and the sole reason is because our feelings are usually off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like we're, we're bad thermometers for what really is. Yeah. So we need to create that wiggle room. Yeah, I could do double, triple that yeah. just so we can hit that number sometimes. Yeah, yeah, bro. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm shooting for the top, but I, I'm big on that. Yeah, it's like because the it's like the music video conversation all over again. Like the money to produce it and then to not make the money back is gonna be more detrimental than if you just didn't do it, you know what I'm saying? And yep. you, you focus that energy on something else. And like the rare situations where like, I think merch giveaways um, can produce like a new fan or like very, very like slim to none. Merch is typically better is just a pure monetization vehicle or to reward people that are already your fans. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like you give that free t-shirt to the person that's already proven his loyalty to you, not to this person you're trying to convince to go listen to your song on Spotify. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, it doesn't have the same impact in that in that scenario. As the person that has been listening to you, he gonna get that shirt, and I'm like, damn, I'm gonna go buy another one for my sister and go get me a hoodie, because this shit is fire. The person that you gave it to, to to check you out is already looking like, man, he had to give me this $40 t-shirt, or however much it costs, for me to go listen to his music, or to even give him a chance to check him out. They're not seriously gonna check you out. Oh, they might, but it's going to be more so like pity. You know what I'm saying? Like you kind of like, <laughs> like bought, yeah. bought their, uh, bought their ear. You know what I'm saying? But especially with ads and everything else, isn't it much, and it's much cheaper. You know what I'm saying? So it, it always comes back to cost, bro. It always does back and comes back to cost. Always, man. Always. Cause <laughs> cost determines on how long you can do it or not. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. Now, speaking of ads, another thing that's overrated. Oh, cheap ads, cheap ads, cheap ads are overrated. Okay. Why are cheap ads overrated? Because I hear again and again and again, oh man, I got my cost per click down to this. I got oh, my cost okay. click per click down to that. But what does that really mean? Yeah. Running ads are more than just getting your cost per click down. Yeah. Ultimately, the whole function of running ads is about the return on your investment. So if I'm an artist marketing my music video, I got my cost per click down. Many people are clicking over to the landing page, but then they're not clicking to watch the video or stream the song. What does it really mean to have a low cost per click, right? Yeah. Or if I'm getting fans in, I don't know, 12 different countries and however many different cities, what does it really mean if I got one fan in 500 different cities? Yeah. Right. But like I had a really low cost per click, but I was just I didn't really tell them where to target so I could get a low cost per click. None of that really makes sense because you're not building a fan base in a specific area enough for you to be able to capitalize on it. Right. So it's always like the starter marketer, right, is looking at cost per click, right? That's like the first thing that you kind of are trained to look at. But over time, you have to adjust to have a legitimate strategy. And honestly, Marketing without a strategy is overrated, right? (laughs) But that's what most people are doing. That's really what it comes down to, right? It's the difference between the team that came to us last year and they were like, hey, I just want to be able to target these two or three cities, find the two or three cities that are making the most sense for this artist and who's responding best. And then when we find that, well, I want to find the best city and do a show six months from now. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, okay. That's really targeted. And it might be more expensive 
to do that. Usually it is. Usually it is, yeah. right. 100% because you're targeting in a specific place, maybe more than ads. It could be other activities that you're doing. But you actually can get a return on your investment. Mm-hmm. So that $1,000 that you spent there and it seemed like you got less out of it might actually be a better return than this $1,000 I spent worldwide and I have no idea how to get my money back. So don't obsess over something being cheap for the sake of cheap, right? Yeah. Or doing whatever marketing activity for the sake of doing a marketing activity. What are you looking to get out of it and what is it creating for you that you can then leverage to get to something else? Yeah, no, I agree 100%. 100%, man. Like Even at this point, our marketing team, I mean, we take what the ad platforms are saying for cost for conversions and clicks into consideration, but we're typically doing our own manual calculations for cost spent versus like smart link conversions, right? Yep. Like, well, I guess it's in brand, man. People know we use one called Toned In. Like you're able to see what the CTR is on there. And so I'm training the team to like, hey, don't look at Facebook saying, hey, it costs you 10 cents a click. Look at your calculations across the clicks on your smart link and do your math on that. So you really might be at 40 cents, a, a true conversion. You know what I'm saying? Something like that. Yep. Um, but that typically is is more impactful because all the cost per click really tells you on the campaign is one of two things. Either you're whether or not you're targeting to a really saturated area or how good your content is. Yeah. Right. Because typically the better the content, the cheaper the cost per click is as well, right? Like good content plus the right audience, cheap ads. Right. right. Good content, bad targeting. Not a cheap, maybe, but not a cheap, right? <laughs> Bad content, either of those markets is going to suck. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So typically, that's how we look at it. Like, you know, the cost per click is letting us know, are we pushing it to the right people? Or are we pushing, or is this piece of content like the right thing? Other than that, it doesn't really tell you much else. Most of your other fan data or listen data is going to come from like your DSPs and like your smart link data and things like that. That's going to tell you like true, honest to God, like behavior patterns amongst the people that you're you're targeting. Because it's also very possible to have a cheap ad that doesn't convert well to the music. We've seen that, right? Yeah. Ads doing 10 cents on the front end. You look at a smart link, they got like a 4% click through rate. And it's like, okay, well, something, there's some gimmick about the content itself that made people click over in droves. But then once they got there, they were like, oh, what the fuck is this shit? I'm not, I don't want this, right? I'm not here for this. It's like, it's the equivalent of like, I'll see a lot of artists a lot of use like skits and things as advertisements. And that's typically the issue there. It's like, hey, all these people are clicking because they thought this shit was funny. And they got to the other side and like, oh, this shit for music? Oh, hell no. You know what I'm saying? Like, no, nah, I'm going, I'm going back to where I came from, right? So it's like you you end up being in a much better position, like training yourself to look at like the cost per back end, even doing your own manual calculations, you know what I'm saying? Versus going like, oh, Facebook said I got a 20 cent cost per click. Ah, okay, this is this is good. It's like, no, that 20 cent ad could be producing a lower quality quality audience for you than that dollar fifty ad. Like we've had a campaign like before. I remember there was one campaign we did for R and B artist. He had an ad running to the US that was doing maybe like a dollar eighteen cent cost per click, but it had like a ninety something percent click through rate on it. So like it's like these people are expensive, but they're very high quality people. Like they're damn near almost always going to go stream something. Yep. And he had a similar ad that was I don't remember where it was pushing to, maybe like I don't even remember. I don't even want to throw that on the country, but it was pushing somewhere none US. And I remember the cost per click on it was maybe like 30, 40 cents, but it was doing like a 40% click through rate on it, right? So it's still pretty good for like the cost of it, but it's like, but these people, the audience of people is hitting for whatever reason are not as high quality as the more expensive ad that we're pushing out. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's always something that has to be taken into consideration. Like, is this, okay, you've established that this audience is cheap, but are they quality, right? Because in most instances, you will be better off like I said, I would much rather have the dollar fifteen cost per click with the ninety percent click through rate than the forty cent. You know what I'm saying? Uh, cost per click ad yep. with the with the forty percent click through rate. And then work right. from there to figure out how can I make this dollar fifteen cheaper. Exactly, because that's yep. much easier to do than, than the reverse of it, right? Like, how do I make these people like this thing more? Yeah. Right. Because like I said, usually we can go like, okay, it's che- it's expensive because you know, well, this video that we're using for the ad is shitty bad content go make some new content right maybe the next video knocks it down to 70 cents or something right so there's always like a way to the process like what is the issue on that end as long as we can at least see that people like the end result which is music you know um so yeah and i agree with you bro i've been waiting for that topic to come up because i didn't know how we was gonna ever bring it up you know what i'm saying but uh, yeah okay man hey no it's it's way too important it's way too important right like we all want to graduate together and, and you know even we have talked about 
getting a cheap cost per click at yeah. one point in time. But, you know, I think it's important to make sure the community keeps elevating and understanding that there's so much more to this marketing than than that, right? It's yeah. a full funnel. Yeah, and then when I started talking to people, I don't even say cheap, I said good. Like, we're looking to get you a good yes. cost per click. You 100%. Because you know <laughs> good can be subjective. <laughs> yeah, hey, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> cheap cheap is not the goal. Winning is the goal, right? And what gets you there. Yeah, um, now, <laughs> getting on platforms too early. Overrated. Matter of mm. fact, I switched it up. I should just say getting on platforms early is overrated. Okay. But too early is especially overrated. And that too early is people asking about Rumble right now, right? Mm -hmm. It's another new platform. And I know that there's this first mover advantage when it comes to should I get on TikTok? Should I get on Triller? Should I get on Dub Smash? Should I get on Rumble? Should I get on Discord? All this stuff. You're like, I heard that if I get on this platform fast and then when everybody else comes, I'm going to blow up because I took advantage of it before everybody else. Whoa, 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 sir. Slow Not necessarily. Slow your roll. Not necessarily. <laughs> There's multiple factors because you still have to do it to the quality where you actually went on that platform. Mm -hmm. One. But you do get some true excessive gains when the platform grows if you are at that top and the platform grows in the way that you think. Yeah. Right? That you think. That's the important part about it because many of these platforms aren't going to grow at all. Not to what you think they are. And here is my issue with the first mover FOMO mentality when it comes to artists. If there's a new platform that comes out and you abandon everything you're doing on your current platform to put most of your effort on this new platform, what if that new platform doesn't exist anymore? What if I said, yo, I'm not going to make any IG videos. I'm going to start doing everything on Triller right now a couple of years ago. And that was your MO. Mm. And then what happened when Twitter wiped out or Triller wiped out? Mm. Gone. Gone. Right, you built this fan base that you can't even tap into anymore. That's completely irrelevant, and now you're out on the game. So what I say is, you can dabble and test some things. Yeah. But especially as a new artist with limited resources and needing to focus, focus on getting good at a platform, like for real good at a platform. Like anybody can invest in YouTube at this point, and be. You know, pretty assured that it's probably going to be around for a minute, yeah. right? Yeah. It might be harder to grow on YouTube now than it was so long ago. However, if you get really, really good at YouTube, you know that there's going to be a positive outcome. Yeah. Right? But some of these new platforms, Be Real, for instance, right now, you can get really, really good at Be Real, whatever that looks like, but you don't know if Be Real is going to be here in 2024. Yeah. You just don't know, right? And that's cool. That's that risk. But you got to understand that that risk is there. And as a new artist, right, with less resources and your time is really meaningful, that risk is so, so dangerous to take. But I get it. I get it. Right. It, yeah. It's a shiny new thing because you've already been losing on another platform. So let me just try to go find <laughs> another platform to win. Yeah. I mean, it's like you said, like the key is the balance, you know, because I, I, I do think artists should set aside maybe at least 10% of their energy to try things out as you as you see it and come across it, right? Give it a little bit yeah. of credence. But I think the important thing is not jumping ship, which artists do have a really bad habit of just completely abandoning the ship, mm -hmm. bro. Like, oh, this shit moving like crazy. I'm going over here. It's like, whoa, whoa, hold up, man. Instagram is still still doing fine. You know, it's not yes. it's not 30X, but you're still doing pretty, pretty good <laughs> over there. So, Yo, hold up real quick. You remember that uh, person? I don't know if you talked to her directly or if I just told you about her. Remember the person was like i went from 13x and now i'm at 5x and they were complaining they were getting a 5x return yeah i do remember that yeah yeah, yeah. that's that's the mentality that you're basically talking about yeah right? exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah i forgot about that shit was crazy yeah, we're talking but, about money by the way yeah, you're yeah, making 15 money. extra yeah. money that you were putting in ads and then they went down to 5x and yeah. were complaining yeah that i get that i understand, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like but it just artists have typically have a really bad habit of like jumping ship you know what i'm saying because i think a lot of them are looking for like one vehicle to focus on so they are chasing you know what i'm saying different vehicles like oh this could just be the one and it's like nah the reality of it is it's probably gonna be the two or three <laughs> you know what i'm saying for you to really build things out and i think the more comfortable artists get with understanding that like the more of a true content infrastructure they can build where it's like hey i do have my 
Yeah, I do have my one or two bread and butters, and every year I take some time out to go try a new platform for like three months. And if I like it, I figure out a way to integrate it into what's going on, right? If I believe in it and I think it's going to be here, I figure out a way to integrate it. And if I don't, at least I didn't kill off my fucking core infrastructure. You know what I'm saying? Like, and I'm still good, you know what I'm saying, to say the least. So I, I think I can, I can, I can stand on that. It's, it's, it's overrated because it just it becomes a new conversation every time a new platform comes. Oh, shit, this new platform hit. How can we use it? It's like, damn, bro, that shit been out for three weeks. Like, let it hit the world first, bro. Let's let the <laughs> let's let the users get into it and yeah. so we can study them and see, bro. Like, I don't know. Like, it just hit the app store. Like, like I said, like, three weeks ago, bro. Like, yep. you know, so. Because I already got people asking me about Be Real strategies. I'm like, bro, I don't know. Yeah. Leave me alone. It, don't don't <laughs> fall for the vision of the founders of these companies that they're selling and they're yeah, marketing, yeah. right? You're on a professional side. As a consumer, you can taste and look, sob up that Kool-Aid however you need to <laughs> all day. But as a professional, this is your career. You can't just be like, oh, yeah, they're selling this vision and they want this to happen and that sounds cool. It's a new thing that's challenging these other platforms, so I should hop on it. That's not how you have to think about it. Yeah. Again, it's a risk assessment. What am I losing by going to this new thing or putting all my effort or how much effort should I put towards that platform? That's what you should be asking. And that varies based on where you are in your career, right? If you haven't got on the internet at first, you know, I mean, if, if you haven't got on the internet in the first place, eh, the risk is pretty low, right? You know, like yeah. t- for whatever you try, yeah. just go try something and start, right? That's the news. But even if you've already invested and you have like 500 followers on IG, that's a level of investment that matters. Yeah. All right. Then they'll let alone 200K, you know, 500K, whatever, whatever. So all these things are something to keep in mind. And look, me, I'm still the person that ultimately says, try to master one platform before you try to get on all these platforms. And I know that we are in a space where you can just copy and paste your reels, right? Mm-hmm. To, to TikTok, to YouTube shorts, what? to choose Snapchat if you want to. But at the end of the day, the nuances and the way the platforms think are different, right? The way they act as a whole are different. So you might copy and paste onto other platforms, but your priority platform should be the platform you focus on the minutia. Get into the details, yeah. right? Understand what they like, what the response rates, how much you should be creating content, um, how hard is it to get a subscriber or follower? What are the things that you need to do on that platform in the description or caption to get people off platform? Like all of those details for that platform is going to be different for YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, whatever um, is out there that you want to think about. So if anything, at least think of it from a model standpoint. If I have one priority platform that I'm truly paying attention to top to bottom. And then I might have content that I can copy and paste and redistribute on other platforms. And hopefully I do get some gains over there. Mm -hmm. All right. But I'm not going to allow that stuff to take my eye off the ball of whatever this priority is. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I agree. What you think about playlisting? Are you going overrated with that one or no? Yeah. We talked about it, but. Yeah, it's overrated, bro. Okay. I feel like it's. uh, So what we were talking about uh, pre-show is I was saying that. You know, it's still a relevant conversation for artists at a certain level. If we go back to my zero to 10 example, I'll keep using super relevant conversation between people from like a zero to like a three. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, I think the higher you get, the more you start to either have discernment for playlisting or you start to understand more about how it fits into the overall marketing infrastructure. Right. And so what I've come to see playlisting as is it is one just a social proof builder right hey this thing was going to do fifty thousand streams let me put an extra 100k on it so i look nicer to my investors or to that booking agent i'm talking to or to that you know that i don't know that that um product guy that wants to maybe give me a sponsorship right like, let me do things that make the numbers look big to people who are not able to get full context in this space right right um and then on top of that, it's a it's a bragging moment. Like once you talk about like getting into like editorial playlists, right? Not like the necessarily run of the mill like third party playlists, but like your you know like your your most necessary, your you know what I'm saying like those those editorials. Those are more like bragging moments. One within the industry, um, but then two to your audience because their audience typically doesn't understand what hoops you have to jump through 
or somebody around you had to jump through to get you on those. So it's cool to say, hey, I got on most necessary. Ah, oh, great. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Go listen to it. Oh, that's great. Great for you. Right. It's a good celebratory moment within your fan base. Outside of that, those two things, it doesn't hit. It never hits like people needed to. And I'm talking about at all levels, bro. Like I was telling you off camera, one of the biggest things that changed the way I looked at playlisting was I had a, a artist homie get into a really big playlist. Um, it might have been like Teardrop or something. Like it was huge. And like they let me look at their back end analytics and what came from it. And the the string spike to drop off looks exactly the same as when you get in an independent playlist. Right. So I'm like, oh, this issue isn't even a bot playlist issue. It's not an independent curator playlist issue. This is just an issue across playlisting as a whole. You know, because like Teardrop is a massive playlist. You know what I'm saying? It's a pretty big playlist, especially in that space. So it's like you literally can see it, the spike, and then the curve drop off, and then it's back to probably just his core audience. Maybe a small bump in the floor from like, you know, new people coming from it. For the most part, like it didn't go back to things didn't go back to like, you know, exactly as they were before the playlist, but like the the increase. And the floor was like very like small compared to like what they saw during the spike. And so that completely changed the way I looked at playlists. And cause I was like, okay, but cause I watched everything else in the moment. Yo, he's on it. I'm watching him get, you know, these uh, people reach out to him and congratulating them and, you know, saying offering all these things, the social proofing aspect of it, right? Hey, this big platform thought you were important enough. So maybe I should see if you're important enough for some shit I got going on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, so I saw that aspect of it. And like I, I just saw like like I, said, I saw the social proofing part of it kind of get put into play, and then looking at the analytics, it's like okay, this is the fan aspect of it, bro. Like they came in, it's cool, they drop off, they go about whatever. I don't think he ever got crazy like other platform engagement from being on it. Could be wrong. I actually do remember seeing one coming on one of his YouTube videos that mentioned seeing him in the playlist, so that was pretty cool, right? Like, but even that goes back to the fan brag moment, right? This is a guy like oh shit, this is my yeah. favorite artist, bro. He's He's in XYZ playlist. He's the cover of XYZ playlist. Like, like those are typically the only two moments where it seems like playlist and cares. Celebratory moment, if you're trying to build social proofing on something. Other than that, shit does not matter. Overwrite it. Stand on it. I'm going to go 100%. And I think the problem is the lack of culture with playlists. Mm -hmm. When I say that, I mean, if you look at a brand as a playlist, brands have trouble scaling and maintaining culture and taste. Yeah. All right? Yeah. I mentioned this earlier on another episode. And if you're not really looked at as a true curator, why will people continue to follow? Most playlists, people get into because of convenience, not out of a cultural pool. Yeah. You know? So... If I see the R and B playlist on Spotify, A R E and B, you know how they flip titles and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm in an R and B mood today, and I want to check that out. I'm gonna follow that playlist, right? But it's not because of true culture, and I'm not looking at it and checking on it repeatedly like I might with somebody who's a tastemaker that I like on TikTok that says, oh, this music is good, and they're already putting me on to new artists. All right. And there's an association and context of telling me why I like it. Right. Like yeah. Sean C saying I like or don't like this because X, Y and Z. All right. So there's that element that's missing from almost everything as you scale up. It becomes really difficult to maintain that with, with artists. Right. That's how people always graduate into selling out in some version in some way. Yeah. But then on the other side of it, it becomes even more difficult when you're a faceless brand. All right. So you're just a you're really a graphic. That's what you are to me on Spotify. <laughs> yeah. I don't really know anything about you anywhere else. I probably don't even follow you on Instagram, anything else like that. There's no lifestyle I associate. It's just a fucking graphic. Yeah. Right. So why am I going to keep checking up on this playlist? So it makes it difficult. And if you talk about these editorial playlists, you look at the benefit on Spotify side. The benefit is there for people to continue to go. To the playlist because it's like yo this playlist is really powerful so we can keep churning and adding to this playlist and focusing on building this playlist because it's bringing us more activity on the platform and that's exactly what we want however spotify finds benefit in that but they aren't limited to benefit from just that what if that doesn't work what if that's too hard what does spotify always get also get benefit from well 
you following another playlist on the platform, right? So, yeah, there was this general R&B playlist, but now it's Valentine's. So I'm just going to pop up this Valentine's Mm -hmm. Day photo and it's going to have some of the same artists possibly and you're going to follow that playlist and it's still my playlist and I'm still getting the listenership, mm-hmm. right? So I don't really care as much about building a culture around a single playlist. Spotify is in constant sales mode, right? That's why they're always changing the covers, right? Changing these names with something clever to constantly attract you in because they know the user can get a little lazy and they're going to find the thing that pulls their attention in at the moment. Yeah. So they have to recapture your attention again and again, refreshing these headlines. That's what you see now on Netflix and these other platforms too, where they'll have five, six different covers. It's like, oh, okay. He's seen this cover like five times. Let him see a different character and think it's a different movie for a second. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. we're still going to get the benefit as long as you stream, period. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that culture isn't there, which makes me think the the stronger culture I've seen around a Spotify playlist editorial specifically was the rap caviar. Yeah. That was what I was aware of. Right? Even I feel like it's kind of weakened. And that was what I was about to ask yeah. you. What is your insight or thought on the, the power of rap caviar today versus what it was before? Yeah, I had never thought about this before, but just thought about it because of what you said about the faceless brand thing. Yeah. At the time when Rap Caviar was really popping was when uh what's his name? Tuma Basa was the one running it. Oh. And we he was the one like Spotify oh. curator that we like knew was over it, right? You were right. And then he leaves and then it goes back to every now every playlist on Spotify is faceless now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's what happened. You are you are right. Yeah. Now, of course, a lot of the consumers don't necessarily know who Tuma is, but he was such a strong face in the industry, built mm-hmm. up, you know, people. He has so much face car in the industry that 100% he was a curator and influencer within the industry yeah. that in many ways influenced the outer industry. Yeah, it was the same way with, uh, what was it, Carl Sherry and Apple? When and Apple, yeah. Apple, and yeah. now he's at Spotify now, right? I think so, yeah. yeah. So it was like yeah. that. It was like these were the two playlist brands where I could go find the person that made it and like follow them on Instagram or yeah. meet them at a conference, right? Versus like today, I don't know who updates teardrop. You know what I'm saying? I don't. I don't know who updates most necessary and uh, maybe some intern. You know what I'm saying? But we'll never know. And so yeah, I think that's what kind of killed it off. Is like that cultural tie just kind of like fell by the wayside because they were like artists want to partner with a person, not an entity. You know what I'm saying? People want to partner. Yeah, with people want to partner with people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like be able to have a face attached to it. So yeah, but I've never thought about that till you said the whole like the whole like people thing. And then today, I mean, there are individual curators. That are front facing, maybe they're like TikTokers or YouTubers and things. And mm-hmm. usually those playlists are the best playlists. Exactly. Like they they have the most engagement. Uh, you see like high scale like impact relative to like whatever you may have had to pay or do to get onto the playlist. You can see the impact carry over into their audience, right? So you could very much so hit a TikToker for a promo post on their page, get in their playlist, and then see the effect that that whole line is having on on that fan that found you from them. Yeah, I saw your post. When his players listened to it, I thought this shit was fire and boom, I'm back, right? And so I do think, like, playlisting still has its place in music. Like, I do think if we could literally graph out all of the music marketing things you could do, like, I would put it on there. I do, I do think there's a time when it makes sense. I just think for most rising artists, it doesn't make sense. One, because you probably are not getting on the playlist that can have that type of impact for you. Um, and then two, the biggest one to me is that it fucks up the rest of your marketing infrastructure build. Because now you're getting all this traffic in so fast from this like relatively unreliable source that you can't you can't accurately fine tune like the other parts of your machine, right? It's like we had a campaign once where I remember we were building out the artist ad funnel, nothing crazy, maybe like a five hundred dollar ad budget, and then you know in the beginning it's easy to see because like you got zero streams and you go to doing a hundred streams a day, it's, it's very clear to see like where that's coming from, right? Yeah. But then the artist gets into a playlist. And then that shit jumps up to doing 10,000 streams a day. And now I can't see where the ad phone is having an impact, right? I can't see where my influencer strategy is having an impact. I can't see where my content strategy is having an impact because you override it with all this playlisting traffic. And so I think that playlisting for a majority of artists makes sense when you have other legitimized parts of your fan funnel built out. Right, like you have your content influencer, whatever that looks like for you. If you can see a very clear correlation between you doing this thing 
or A thing and Z output being made and you have tried that enough to see that it consistently works, at that point I can understand when an artist wants to do playlisting. Yeah. I equate that to constraints and marketing. Mm. That's how we look at it, right? When we think about scaling the company, yeah, we marketers, right? We can market our asses off, create all kind of viral campaigns, cool campaigns. We can do that. But what does that matter if our infrastructure isn't built out and there's no business set in place yeah. that can capitalize off of the marketing that occurs, right? Yeah. yeah. And then what if there's no operations within that business that truly can fulfill to the scale of the marketing? Yeah. So we're constantly, you know, at this ebb and flow. Oh, let's build the infrastructure to a certain place. And then we can scale using all types of tactics. Playlisting would fall as a part of that, like one of the top layers of scale and what your analogy is, right? Yeah. Because you have your infrastructure just enough in place, the initial marketing, and then you have the marketing that's like, I'm going to go bigger. Yeah. Right? But when you think about those tiers, it's always starting with, well, hey, do I have enough infrastructure in place? And if I'm marketing, is it overrated to start it now or is it overrated to start it later? Because that's what this whole list comes down to, right? Like, it's not, none of these things are useless, yeah. right? Yeah. But their usefulness comes down to when they're executed. Yeah, 100% context. Context is everything. That's like my motto, man. That's like my life motto for real. Like, I, I hate things out of context. I hate being taken out of context. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and those nuances make a massive impact. But and we appreciate you guys tuning in for this episode, episode number 18. I'm Sean. And I'm Corey. And we out. Peace.